So I said I'm a wildlife assistance biologist. Um, I'm in the wildlife assistance program. Uh, as far as what that is, we're a department within the Division of Habitat and Species Conservation at the Fish and Wildlife. And we handle calls about human wildlife conflict. So what that means is anytime somebody has a question or a concern or they don't know if something might be dangerous or they're really upset because property got damaged, they go ahead and give us a call. Um, and our goal is to promote peaceful coexistence between wildlife and people. Florida's population is always increasing. Our wildlife is still maintaining itself. That means invariably humans and wildlife are going to cross paths. We want to try and make that as stress-free and productive for everybody as we can. So why does FWC manage wildlife? I mean, aside from the fact that we got named for it, um, we follow what's called the public trust doctrine. Um, what that means is that no one person or group can own wildlife. It's held in trust for everybody in the public. Uh, and it's held in trust by the government and managed by the government for the general public and for future generations. So, and, um, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, you should come and get your raccoon that was in my garbage. So, well, it's everybody's raccoon, I'm really sorry. Um, but what that does mean is that we try and manage the wildlife on everybody else's behalf so that you don't have to be out measuring trees and counting newts in the woods, you know, we can do it for you. So, tonight, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we do about the common species that you're going to see around here and what you can do to make your life and their lives a little easier. So, in the Wildlife Assistance Program, um, we take right around 12,000 calls a year, give or take. Um, the bulk of those, as you can see, are bears. It's a little over 40% every year is calls just about bears all across Florida. That's our number one species that we talk about. Um, the next part of the pie is mammals. Um, that includes kind of all of our mammals. Um, our second most common species that we get calls for after bears um, is a big part of that pie, that pie wedge, which is coyotes. Um, we get bears and then coyotes are the second most common, um, and then several of other of our mammal species um, kind of rank after that. And then um, birds is another pretty big one. Um, we get calls on ID, birds hanging out too much, birds not hanging out enough, um, birds that are injured. And then we do get quite a lot of non-native calls. We get about 10 or 11 percent um, calls for non-native species, whether this is south um, with people that are living near the Everglades and they're concerned about Burmese pythons or iguanas, um, or if it's folks that are up here and they're, you know, for instance, we get a lot of human tree frog sightings and people want to know how can I dispose of these humanely because they don't belong here, they're eating our native wildlife. So among these, and then um, herps is any reptiles or amphibians and, you know, snakes in the garage or what is this thing I found in my yard. Um, and uh, general tends to be regulations questions, um, folks that are looking for specialty permits, uh, and you know, people who are seeing chupacabras and want to let us know about it. So, um, <laughs> among what we're, we're talking about tonight, uh, primarily I'm going to talk a lot about the things that are in the mammals column because that's where we get a lot of our calls. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of different species overviews, give you some general information about some of the most common species, um, and then kind of go into a section about what you guys can do to make it so that they're not that interested in you and you don't have to be that interested in them because you're already doing everything that would make them just want to not bother and kind of pass everybody by. So first thing we're going to talk about is coyotes. Um, I will touch on bears just a little bit. Um, it's not very common in Duval County to see a bear unless they've accidentally wandered north from St. Thomas County or if they come in. Um, sometimes we'll get a few calls on the northern part of Duval County, so it's possible in some of the parks you might occasionally see a bear. It's really rare here. However, it's always good to know because we have them in a lot of other parts of Florida. So, coyotes are here in Florida. We have them in all of our counties. We have them in all of our major urban areas. Um, but they didn't start coming here until uh, the late 70s, early 80s. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. The two biggest ones are that the red wolf, the southern red wolf, that used to be uh, common throughout the southeastern United States, and the gray wolf in the north, their numbers plummeted. The red wolf is functionally extinct in the wild, and the gray wolf is only in a few areas in, in a few states up north. 
So once these animals were no longer common throughout the east, eastern part of the United States, coyotes were able to start migrating eastward from the prairies and the western parts of the country, and they slowly made their way here. So wolves love to eat coyotes. They also compete with them for different prey animals. And just the fact of wolves being in the area makes coyotes a lot more wary and uh, just not able to move around as much. So without wolves here in Florida, coyotes were able to migrate in. Um, they are considered naturalized now because of that, because they didn't move themselves here. The other big key is that we converted the landscape. So coyotes can use forested areas, but they like open areas a lot better. They can use the open areas to find a lot more of the types of prey that they like. Open grasslands, especially open grasslands with wooded and brushy areas along the edge, like we often make, you know, we've got a nice pasturage with a big lawn with a view, and then we've got the nice edge brush along the way where we've got a little strip of forest so we don't have to look at our neighbor's house. It's perfect for coyotes. They love bugs and they love to eat mice and rodents. So they love grasslands because those guys thrive on there. So just a really quick overview of um, what we sort of found over the years on how coyotes were moving in and through Florida. Um, this is our county by county map. We're gonna color it in. So in 1983, the first population study was done here in Florida. Um, Brady and Campbell found coyotes in these counties. A few years later, they found them spread a lot farther. Then sent survey data, found them in those counties, plus two additional ones. That was in 97 to 99. Carcass data from around the same time, found them in four more counties. And then since then, personal communication with um, either confirmed tracks or confirmed photos has put them in all the rest of our counties as well. <laughs> now, the farthest southern sighting that we've ever had on a coyote here in Florida is Key Largo. It is probably also not a coincidence that the largest feral cat colony in the state is also in Key Largo. So, <laughs> coyotes have been found as far south as Key Largo and they are in every single one of our counties. This coyote is swimming Lake Worth Lagoon. Um, a boater actually sent this into us and gave us permission to use this. Um, coyotes are really good swimmers, so although a lot of times people on coastal communities or barrier islands will say, we didn't think we could have those here, because we live on an island, first of all, almost every island in Florida here has a bridge. And second of all, this guy had no problem swimming the lagoon. Um, coyotes are really adaptable and they are really good at traveling, including swimming. Um, I've actually personally gotten calls from people who live on Amelia Island who've actually caught them using the bridges late at night when there's not much traffic. So um, they're, they're really good at using what we provide to get around, even onto the island communities. Um, so they, they do move around pretty easily, so it is possible for them to get all around Florida, um, even into the urban areas. So a little bit about coyote biology. Coyotes are omnivores. They're really adaptable with what they eat. If one type of food that they usually eat is missing, they'll just switch to something else. They're not too fussy. Um, adults usually weigh between 25 to 40 pounds. Um, so far we have not had any reported coyotes larger than 40 pounds here in Florida. Home range. So in natural, more rural areas, what um, studies have found is that coyotes can use up to about 15 square miles per coyote family, which is usually a mated pair. They stay mated for a long time, so they stay together long term, um, and then whatever offspring they're raising. In urban areas, um, one of the largest urban populations of coyotes is actually in Chicago. And they're studying them very heavily there. They actually have radio collared um, several hundred coyotes over the years by now and tracked them. And they found that urban coyotes, all of their resources are a lot closer together. The food is more dense. And so they only need about three square miles per family. Um, they mate in the winter. Um, right around now is actually the mating season. And then they give birth in the spring. Litter size can vary um, anywhere from two to 12 coyote pups. Average size is around six. Um, Litter size will often frequently depend on what resources they have available. So if they have more resources, they can have more pups and successfully raise them. And both parents care for the young. Coyote families are um, have included both mom and dad for care. They'll both raise them, guard them, and teach them how to hunt and be adult coyotes later. So when I was talking about the weight ranges, um, we actually wanted to know a lot more about what was going on with our coyote population here. So we did 
a study where we requested coyotes from all over the state. Um, since, uh, since a lot of things happened to coyotes, we got them from a lot of different sources, from rural areas, urban areas. We got coyotes that were hit by cars, coyotes that were shot for being nuisance animals, um, fur bearers that were trapped. Uh, but this is the weights that we got out of the coyotes. You can see that it kind of peaks. The blue is females and the gray is males. So the females do weigh on average a little less than the males. But the bulk of the coyotes are right around 25 to 30 pounds. Um, you see a couple up in the 35 to 40 range, none of the females. The largest coyote that we weighed in this study was 39.8 pounds. So is it possible that there are coyotes that are bigger than that in Florida? It is possible. We are always looking for more sample data. So if you know somebody who is catching coyotes or um, you know, hits one in the car and they think, man, this thing is a monster, um, if they're willing to give us a call so that we can measure the, the carcass and take some data from it, we'd be happy to. We're always looking for that. But we do get a lot of calls from people that say, man, I saw one that was bigger than my 100 pound German Shepherd. And so far in Florida, nothing that we've seen has indicated that we have coyotes that get much bigger than the average of 25 to 30 with a top weight being just a little under 40 pounds. Um, the other thing that we took with this, mostly this was a diet study, but we took as much other data as we could, is what are coyotes actually eating here? This is a question a lot of people have because they want to know what, what do I have to worry about them getting into. So this is really cool. Um, you can see that they eat a wide variety of stuff. Um, the main thing that we have is the big, the big blue pie wedge here is mammals. That's about a third of their diet, 31%. Um, you see the vegetation, it says other vegetation, this is 22%, and then the dark blue over here is mast. Other vegetation is things like tender grasses, tender greens, any roots that may be edible that they're eating. Mast crops are nuts and berries. So actually vegetation is about a third of their diet as well. Insects is 15%, so they're digging up ant larvae, you're eating uh, grasshoppers or other things out of the grasslands. Now the one that is really important to us the one that affects us and that we can control the most is this dark gray pie wedge right here, anthropogenic. Anthropogenic is a big $5 word that means humans provided this food. Um, anthropogenic food is food from a human-based source. This is pet food, garbage, litter that's thrown on the side of the road. Um, this food is the food that we can control and that we can stop them from getting because this is really high calorie food and it makes a big difference in their behavior. So I have a couple of photos. If any of you have just had dinner, <clears throat> these are not too graphic, but they are really interesting. I think they're worth looking at. So we have some gut contents. Um, the scientists actually took pictures of the gut contents that we found for a lot of these, and I pulled a couple of the highlights. <coughs> the first one, this is a coyote that was trapped in St. Joseph Peninsula State Park. Um, Cabernet mini eggs. I know he didn't buy those himself. So he, he ate those, somebody either littered those or deliberately fed a coyote or um, he got into somebody's trash on uh, one of the campgrounds and he had a Cadbury mini egg packed in his stomach. This next one is really, really cool. This is a total of 47 small mammals, mostly various types of rodents, found in a coyote's stomach that was shot in Morrison. The really interesting thing about this is it takes coyotes about five hours to digest their food. So all of these were eaten before he could digest them. So 47 of these in about five hours. Now a coyote doesn't eat 24 hours a day, but if you calculate that over the course of the amount of time he is hunting in a day, times a week, they make amazing pest control. These guys are actually providing a really important service to the ecosystem that other animals are not doing. They are eating a huge amount of rodents out of the ecosystem, which is a really big deal for us since they rodents are actually not so much fun when they're in mass. This next one is one of the reasons I really like coyotes a whole lot. I know it's a little bit hard to see on the sign, but that says roaches. That coyote has a stomach full of roaches. Good pest control. What, and it shows just how adaptable coyotes are with their diet. They will eat anything that's available. If roaches are abundant, they will chow down. <laughs> if mice are abundant, they'll eat mice. They'll kill mice for you. If garbage is abundant, they will take garbage. So what we want to do is encourage them to do this. So some of the positive impacts that coyotes can have is actually control of these smaller predators that we have here in Florida. Um, 
These guys, for since the last known wolf, red wolf in the wild, was killed in the early 1920s in Florida. We haven't had any red wolves in the wild since then. For a long time, these small to medium-sized predators, what we call mesopredators, have gone without any real natural checks and balances, except maybe cars. So these guys may be out of balance. Um, you know, opossums, raccoons, some of these other animals are also um, egg seekers. They love to eat brown nesting bird eggs or eggs that are up in uh, trees because some of these guys can climb. Um, coyotes do eat all these animals and that can really help balance out sort of the ecosystem as far as helping, helping reduce these numbers. Um, I told you guys that in an urban area, a coyote family still needs at least three square miles to, to raise their young and live successfully. In one square mile in an urban area, you can have up to 25 adult raccoons. So in that same coyote territory, you can have 75 raccoons preying on small wildlife in that same place. Um, as you can see, a coyote might take a nest of eggs if it finds one on the ground, because they are opportunistic. However, they are eating these guys who seek them out deliberately, so they have that benefit. The result to that if you want to hold on to questions, folks, I'm sorry, I didn't say that at the beginning, but if you want to hold on to questions, we will have a question and answer afterward. The result for that is that a lot of these endangered songbirds, threatened uh, storks, ground nesting birds like turkey and quail, will a coyote eat a quail? Of course. If it has the opportunity, it will. Will it eat other things if it comes across them? It will, but it doesn't deliberately seek them out, and it can have a net benefit cleaning up some of these small predators that do seek these animals out and will eat them with preference. So we think, from what we're seeing, is that coyotes are having something of a net benefit overall to the ecosystem, which can kind of out, at least balance out some of the issues that we see with them moving into the urban areas. Another note, a lot of people ask me what they call me, and they say, is it because we're doing a lot of construction or they're having less forested areas to go into that they're in the urban areas? Coyotes aren't being pushed out of anything. Coyotes seek out urban areas because the food is denser, it's easier to find. They like living there. Chicago has had coyotes for many more years than Florida has, and their coyotes are very, very successful there. Um, but people almost never see them because they actually have a really good handle on keeping human-based sources of food away from them. So then when they do diet studies, they do find the coyotes there eating almost no human-based sources of food. So, as far as these guys go, um, they can have a net benefit. So they're not just all bad, they're not just all scary stories. But one other thing that we do see as far as um, reducing the populations of the smaller predators, uh, the Florida Department of Health's 20 year baby study just came out about a month or two ago. Um, just to let you know, although this data is accurate, this is a little bit out of date as far as um, being up to date till right this moment. Um, from 97 to 2016, we did only have one case of rabies in a coyote that was, that was tested positive. Um, we did about almost two weeks ago, we did have another coyote test positive for rabies in another part of Florida. Um, but you know, this data is still accurate as far as it stopped in 2016, but we have now had two known cases of coyote rabies in Florida since the DOH has been keeping records, as opposed to just one. Um, the thing to note here is that coyotes have had one case in that 20 year period, whereas raccoons have had 1,800 at the same time. Raccoons are our most common rabies carrier in Florida. Coyotes love to eat raccoons. The other one to note is that domestic cats had 230 cases of rabies in the same time period. Um, Reducing the numbers of small and medium-sized predators that are, that are mammals that are capable of catching it does help reduce all kinds of disease spread, whether it's rabies, whether it's distemper, or other diseases like maize. Lower density populations tend to not spread diseases as fast. It's simply something that we notice in all kinds of animal communities. So our next animal that we're going to talk about uh, is actually going to be our bobcat. This is the smaller of our two big cat species here in Florida. Um, I say this guy is a big cat. I know compared to the Florida panther, he doesn't seem like a really big cat, but he is, he is a North American big cat species. Um, we don't have Florida panther here in Duval County. Uh, you know, occasionally people do wonder if they have seen them, but we do get a lot of mistaken identities when we get trap pictures and things. We can ID it from people, and we 
have not had any confirmed panther reports, which is either track pictures or photos of the animal. Um, certainly they do wander, the young males will wander. We actually had one um, killed several years ago in St. John's County at the southern border. Um, he was um, killed by a car. So the males can wander a long way, but we haven't had any come this far north. The bobcat is fairly easy to tell apart. They are much smaller. They tend to weigh 20 to 30 pounds. Um, they're, only, they're only about a foot and a half tall. The ear spots on the back of the ears are a dead giveaway for bobcats. These guys have pointy ears and they have white spots on the back of their ears. And then they do have a tail. People often say, well, I saw a tail on that animal. It can't be a bobcat. But they think that a bobcat can only have a tail this long. And don't realize that sometimes bobcats will have tails up to eight inches. So especially if you catch them in the shadows and they're whipping their tail back and forth, it may look like an even longer tail than that. Um, when these guys are on the move, it can be really hard to tell. But they do have a shorter tail than our other North American cats. Um, and it does have a white tail tip underneath. The other interesting thing about bobcats is that their color can vary really widely. Um, this is the most common color, sort of a reddish tan with gold spots, but they can be anywhere from a pale sand color with no spots on them, all the way to a dark black fur coat. Um, these guys do have the gene for what we call melanism, which is when their fur is all dark. And so we actually do have bobcats here in Florida that turn up periodically, um, that you can only see the spots on the skin. The fur is actually all black all over the top of it. So these guys are pretty shy. They tend to be fairly elusive. Um, you can see them either in the day or at night. Bobcats only sleep for two to three hours at a time, just like any cat, they can nap. So seeing them in the daytime is not an emergency. Um, it's normal for them. Uh, these guys will eat mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, mostly small stuff. Um, unlike the coyote, these guys are carnivores. They don't like to eat vegetation at all, so they will, they will prey on things. Um, one type of damage that's sort of the most common that we see is um, small pets that are left unattended outside or livestock, free range chickens take a big hit from bobcats. Um, and then uh, a lot of times, um, if, you, if you have neighborhood ducks or things like that, they can also, they can also be an issue. Um, these guys are actually fairly tolerant of pretty heavily suburban and urban areas. Um, they're not as urbanized as a coyote, but we will see them turn up in some surprising places. They're just much better at not being seen. Um, but they are, they are pretty easy to guard against as far as taking care of problems. If your livestock is properly penned, um, you stay with your small pets when they're outdoors. And when you do see a bobcat, you want to scare it. That tells them that this is your space and you want to keep your space and they'll make an effort to stay out of your way. This guy is really common. Also like a coyote, this animal is heavily urban. We have these everywhere in Florida, um, both in rural and urban areas. So raccoons can have really high population densities. Um, they eat just about anything. They do love our human sources of food. They love anthropogenic diets, high calorie, easy to get. Um, they can cause all kinds of damage, whether it's tearing down sweet corn in fields. Um, they'll actually go after young sweet corn and they really like it when it's not quite ripe. Um, they'll get into structures. If you've ever had raccoons in your attic, you know it could be a real hassle to get them out. Um, they will actually roll up sod. If you have sod installed, they'll uh, roll it up to get at the bugs that are underneath it. And it sounds funny, but when they destroy a couple thousand dollars worth of your brand new grass because it dried out overnight when you weren't watching, it's not too much fun. Um, and raccoons, because they do sort of get anywhere and everywhere, they can fight with pets. And you know, raccoons are not as large as some of our other wildlife, but you can get raccoons that are easily up to 20 pounds. And for smaller pets, that's still quite a, quite a dangerous animal. Um, fastening garbage can lids, um, raccoons can usually be kept out with something like a bungee cord or clips. Um, it doesn't have to be quite as burly as it does to be bear food. Um, bring bird feeders indoors at night. If you know you've got raccoons in the area that are causing an issue, if you do find any bird feeders getting knocked over or emptied overnight, that's one good way to keep them out of it. Um, removing still bird seed from the ground so that it's not just there on the ground at night attracting all kinds of things for them to eat and picking up pet food so that it's not unattended outdoors are really important. If you have raccoons in your garden or if you have an issue with raccoons, um, say a commercial structure, lightweight electric fencing is a fantastic way to deal with these guys. Um, it's light, it's easy to put up. Modern electric fencing is incredibly safe and it will stop a raccoon. Uh, it'll stop just about any other kind of wildlife too. It's, uh, it's really, really 
a great tool that we love to use for a lot of different situations. So snakes. This is the wildlife everybody loves to hate, right? <coughs> snakes, we have over 40 species of snakes here in Florida. Um, now these guys are also not plant eaters, they eat meat, but their definition of meat is really wide, so they lay tadpoles, fish, slugs, bugs, worms, rodents. Um, these guys are also outstanding pest control. Um, you probably have a lot of very small snakes that you never see because they live mostly underground that are taking care of pests in your garden. Um, they all spend a lot of time just eating slugs and bugs. Um, these guys don't actually cause any property damage normally. Um, there isn't really too much that a snake can get into that will damage your property unless you have one that accidentally climbs into a transformer box and shorts it out or something. Um, they, they're not good at digging holes, their teeth can't chew anything, they're very quiet, they won't keep you up at night barking, but a lot of people are very, are very nervous about snakes. So there's more of a perceived danger than an actual, any kind of property damage. Um, knowing how to identify the snakes that you need to be concerned about or are more cautious with is the best way to go about knowing what you need to do about snakes. But you can trim back your vegetation so that it's not right down to the ground. Um, you want to keep the brush piles up. Brush piles not only give snakes cover, which is one of the main things wildlife needs is a place to rest, but it also gives them a place to hunt food, so you want to remove those. Stack firewood up off the ground, so you want to put firewood up on a stand, which actually saves your firewood from getting damp and useless also. Um, and then if you do get one in the house, a really easy way to take care of it, if you can't just shoe it out the door with a broom, is to actually use a glue trap. Um, and you can pour vegetable oil onto it once you've got the snake outdoors, and that will release it from the glue trap. Um, if you have any more questions about that, that's something that I can always tell you about later. Uh, now, we have some really cool snakes here in Florida. There are some that are commonly mistaken for others. Um, there are no snakes that are not beneficial. There are only some snakes that you need a little more caution with. So these are some of our non-venomous snakes. Um, these guys are really great. They're good to have around. Um, our eastern indigo is the big guy here on the left. Eastern indigo snakes aren't threatened. These guys, we're trying to help them recover here in the state of Florida. If you do see one of these, please leave them alone. They are protected species. The reason that these guys get such a bad rap is this is our largest North American snake, and they're really fast. So if you see an eight-foot snake that's two and a half inches around zipping around your yard, it probably can cause you to panic some. However, indigo snakes are wonderful. They eat other snakes, they eat rodents, and they don't want to bother with us. So they are great to have around. Um, yellow rat snake and the racers and the corn snake are a lot more likely to be seen in the Timucuan Parks area and in Duval County. Um, yellow rat snakes are ones that often will get calls about being in structures because these guys do like to climb. Um, they're big into eating birds and they like rodents, so they'll get into barns, sheds, and other structures where they can climb around looking for those. Um, corn snakes, these guys are called corn snakes because the stomach pattern looks like um, patterned corn. Um, these get mistaken a lot for uh, copperheads, for rattlesnakes, because they do have a heavy pattern and people that aren't too sure about their snake ID will often kill them and then say, hey, can you identify this snake for me? And so, well, unfortunately, that one was, was a non venomous snake. Um, but these guys are really beneficial. They are big rodent eaters. And then black racers, the adult is on the top and the juvenile is on the bottom. The juvenile is patterned and then they turn darker and darker as they get older. These guys get mistaken a lot for baby pygmy rattlesnakes um, when they're little. They are also harmless, um, and they also eat a ton of pests. Um, black racers also cause a lot of concern because, just like their name says, they're incredibly fast, and so a lot of times you don't get a good look at them because they're running away from you at high speed. Now, as far as our venomous snakes go, this is the thing. We have more than 40 species of snakes. You don't need to know those. All you need to know is these, and you can actually skip this guy on the bottom. He's beautiful, but you don't have to know about the copperhead because we don't have those here in Duval County. They only exist in the western part of the Panhandle, um, in the Apalachicola River Basin and farther west. So you only have to know five. Three of them are rattlesnakes, that makes it easy. Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake here is a pretty good sized snake, has diamonds on his back and a rattle on his tail. Our cane brake or timber rattlesnake, we have these in here in North Florida. Um, we're just about at the southern limit of their range, but we do have them. And then our pygmy rattlesnake, 
which is a little guy, and the only thing you have to worry about that is that they're not very loud. Um, but they tend to they tend to just kind of hang out and try to move out of the way if they can. The coral snake <coughs> is pretty distinctive. Um, now, does everybody know the rhyme? Yes. See, the kids always say yes, the adults are never quite sure if they've got it the right way around. <laughs> it's red touch yellow, kill a fellow, red touch black, friend of Jack, right? For grown-ups who don't remember rhymes as well, if you see a yellow light and it turns red, what do you do? Oh, wow, you guys are really good at this because always somebody says you speed up and that's the people that get in because when the red and the yellow touch, you stop. When yellow turns to red, you stop, and then you don't get bit. Now, we do also have these guys, scarlet king snakes. Um, these guys have a red snout as opposed to a black snout on a coral snake, and they don't have red touching yellow. Um, yellow does not go to red for these guys. And these guys are also snake eaters. They're almost entirely snake eaters, and they are a harmless non-venomous snake that mimics the coral snake to not get eaten by other wild um, Our last one is cottonmouth. This guy gets the worst press out of any snake that I've met since moving to the south. Um, where I grew up, we do have, I grew up up north, we do have rattlesnakes, but we don't have cottonmouths. And uh, I've heard more stories about cottonmouths chasing me. People will come up to me and they'll say, I was chased for two miles by a cottonmouth. <laughs> the next time somebody tells you that, look at them and say to yourself, can that person run two miles? <laughs> snakes are only this far off the ground. If a snake is moving the same direction as you, they're running away in the same direction you are because they can't see you. So just turn 90 degrees and move that direction. They will just keep going. Um, the thing about these guys is that all snakes are beneficial, even venomous ones. These guys perform a really important task. Um, they eat rodents, they eat rabbits, they help keep those species in check that have those big boom and bust cycles. And one of the other things that researchers are finding out is because we have these guys, and because these, um, the Eastern Diamondback, the Timber Rattler, um, some of these guys are larger species of snakes, they're eating mammals that have tons of ticks on them, and so they help keep the tick population down. And although a venomous snake bite is dangerous, if you leave them alone, they won't bite you. Ticks, on the other hand, carry lots of human diseases, so there is some benefit to these. So this one I am going to talk about briefly simply because we do occasionally get them. Um, and because if you go to Canada, I mean, you guys are here because the Timaquan Parks Association advertised this. You must like the outdoors. If you go other places in Florida, this will be something you need to know. So this can be handy. Um, we do have Florida black bears. It's rare to see them around here, but we do occasionally get one that wanders in. Um, their diet is about 80% vegetation, whether it's grass, nuts, berries, um, tender vegetation that's just coming out. Um, they eat about 16% bugs, ant larvae, termite mounds, um, you know, they break open logs and eat all the beetle larvae out of it. Um, they do love bees. And then only about 4% is meat, and it's usually stuff that they're finding already dead. They're carrion eaters. Um, bears are scavengers and browsers. They do not generally hunt for live food. You will find an occasional bear that will do that, but it's really unusual. Um, However, because they're big and heavy, they can cause a lot of damage. Even a bear who's walking over a fence to get somewhere to go to somewhere else can damage your fence, and it can be expensive. Um, they do damage wildlife feeders if they're not made to be bear-proof. Um, you know, property structures like fences, garbage cans, ornamental plants. If you put up the really nice thornless blackberries, like I have thornless blackberries in my yard that I grow, if I lived in bear country, I would have to put a fence around those. Um, you know, that's free food for a bear. Um, they are naturally timid and shy of people. <laughs> As an example, bears prefer avoidance. Bears are the ultimate calorie counters, but unlike us, where we're trying to be the biggest losers, bears are trying to keep all their calories. Conflict costs calories. Bears don't like conflict. It wastes calories. So 90% of the time, they're going to run, hide, or climb a tree. A tree is like a security blanket to a bear. Once they're up the tree, you can't scare them away anymore. They're already in their safe place. As an example, you see that this cat takes this bear up the tree. This is a house cat. He treed this bear twice. That's why they were able to get a really good picture of it, because the second time they had the camera ready. Um, bears do not like conflict. They will avoid it if they can. The biggest thing to do about bears is simply to keep the food sources away from them, and they will continue to eat their natural sources of food. 
And that's pretty much all you need to know. If you have additional questions about fairies, I'll be more than happy to have you call me up at the regional office and ask me. I can tell you all kinds of other cool stuff about fairies, but they prefer to avoid conflict. <laughs> he weighs about 10 times what that cat does. So how do we prevent problems with wildlife? I've told you guys all sort of the basics about the wildlife that we have around here. But the biggest thing that you can do, and the reason that I'm going to harp on this over and over and over again, is because everywhere in North America that people practice this, it works. It works in cold places, hot places, wet places, and dry places. Securing attractants is the most effective thing that anybody can ever do to prevent problems with wildlife. Um, never feed coyotes or other wildlife. Um, as far as coyotes go, anything that can attract a dog, a cat, or a raccoon can also attract them. And you really don't want to attract raccoons either, so make sure that things are up. Um, we want to secure garbage. We want to clean up pet food, fallen fruit, and bird feeders. Bird feeders, um, if you have a design that has a lot of spillage, you may want to fill it less or take it in at night. Um, bird seed on the ground, coyotes, raccoons, and other animals will come actually in boxes, will come to eat the bird seed, and they will also come to eat the bugs, rodents, and other animals that come to eat the seed. So you're really making a, a grand buffet if you have a lot of seeds filled on the ground. Um, fallen fruit, the same thing. Drop fruit is a great source for all kinds of wildlife to come to your house. Um, for those of you who really like your lawns, armadillos love rotten fruit, so this is a really good incentive to keep the fruit trees completely picked up and cleaned. Um, so keep cats indoors. FWC's official position is that cats do belong inside. Um, I will be happy to talk a little bit more about cats that just absolutely don't go inside. The safest place for a cat is indoors. I have cats. I have three cats that are over the age of 16, including one that's actually made it just to her 20th birthday. Um, they're indoor cats. I live on a street with stray dogs, cars. There are some of the snakes in my area. Um, I don't trust my cats not to be jerks and try to smack it on the head. So really, if they don't mind their own business, I just keep them in where they can't mess with those. Um, there are a lot of dangers out there for cats, um, hawks and owls that he calls about. And rather than have to worry about any of that or for them picking up worms or something outside, I keep my cats inside. 100% of the time, I know that those things are not gonna happen to them. My cats don't get worms from being outside. I don't have to worry about stray dogs or anything like that. Um, keep dogs on fixed leashes and supervised while outside, especially small dogs. And these coyote nests are actually getting really popular out west where they have a much higher population of coyotes. Um, when I say a fixed leash, I mean a six foot high long lead. If you go online, you can actually find articles about a dog that went viral if you haven't already seen it. Um, somebody posted a picture on their Instagram of their dog getting ready to go for a walk with their coyote vest on. And people Photoshop her into a whole bunch of different exotic places. So you can go online and see more pictures of these. Um, extendable leashes are dangerous for your dog. They're actually also not good for you because I've seen a lot of people get injured, like cuts on their legs and hands from trying to grab a dog that's, that's extending the leash too fast. Um, a six foot lead keeps your dog close enough that wildlife knows you're with it. They can smell you, hear you, and see you when your dog's on a fixed lead. If your dog is on an extendable leash, especially if you're out hiking on trails, especially if they really uh, have a lot of bushes or anything. Um, if a coyote, for instance, is napping under a tree and he's just asleep in the shade and he wakes up and he smells and sees and hears a dog, and that dog is 20 feet in front of you and that skinny little lead is the only thing connecting you to it, that coyote's not going to see the leash or smell or hear you. He might think your pet is unattended and he might take the opportunity because they are opportunistic. If your dog is on a fixed leash, whenever the dog is smelled and seen and heard, you are too. And human presence is the best deterrent for wildlife issues as far as pets go. Um, the coyote vests, these are um, Cordura or Kevlar vests with little spikes on them and the whiskers. And I, I have not personally used this with my dog, but there's a lot of really great testimonials online. People use them um, in areas where hawks have to swoop down. Um, to help prevent hawk damage and coyote damage um, because they will, especially out in California, people really do live kind of up in all those canyons and things, and there's a ton of wildlife out there. So you can you can make your dog a sock of the, sock of the block and protect it from wildlife. So other ways to prevent problems. So these were the passive things. If, you, if you're removing human sources of food, those high calorie rewards, and wildlife has no reason to hang out. Um, hazing. Hazing is not a frat party type of hazing. This is 
scaring an animal without causing an injury. We don't want to injure our wildlife when we're hazing it because injured animals are unpredictable, just like it would be with a cat or a dog. However, human dominance, make yourself look big, get loud. Um, those things are things that wildlife understand. Coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, have things like, this is, this is actually free out of the recycle bin. This is an animal hazing device. We call it a coyote shaker because people really like to use them with coyotes. It does work on everybody else. Um, these are lightweight enough you can throw them at wildlife without injuring them. But if this lands near them and it, it makes a racket, it's going to scare the heck out of them. Um, there are other devices. Um, air horns are fantastic. Air horns are really inexpensive. And even folks without a lot of physical strength can use these no problem. And it's really hard for wildlife to be used to them. Um, there are also things like motion sprinklers. Um, this is. I think this one's called the Cobra Water Jet, but they come in a bunch of different brand names. Um, the motion sensor, the animal crosses in front of the motion sensor, and it sprays a hard jet of water to the face. Um, I know it seems a little bit like why they picked it up at Acme, but it's really effective for a lot of stations. Um, we actually use these in the Wildlife Assistance Program for everything from aggressive sandhill cranes to bears to coyotes, um, and people even use them just on deer to keep them out of their ornamental plants. So they're really, really effective. You can pick up a lot of these scare devices at a lot of uh, big box gardening stores. Um, motion detector lights can certainly help, especially um, wildlife tends to get used to motion detector lights after a little while, but what's really handy about it is that if there's something moving around and you want to go out to your car or bring your dog out for a bathroom break, if the light's on, you know something has been in the area, so you can kind of shout out the door and get that animal to move on before you take your pet out. Um, firecrackers are also really useful. Now this one's key if you live in a neighborhood, that bottom one, bear spray. If you live in a neighborhood and you're concerned about something happening, <coughs> say if you have a, a neighbor who is worried, you know, they said, well, you know, there was a really aggressive stray dog in the area, or, um, you know, I had a cat taken by a coyote. If you live in a neighborhood, you have to worry you can't ethically fire a weapon except under extreme circumstances and you don't want to worry about hitting anything. Bear spray is not lethal. If your pet chases a raccoon and gets in a fight with it, you can use bear spray and your dog is going to have a really bad day, but he'll be fine later. So this is something that will get a wildlife animal to run away. It works on all kinds of species, not just bears. Um, we highly recommend bear spray for wildlife deterrent, especially if you're out camping. <coughs> um, if you're camping in most of Florida, aside from here, we really strongly recommend bear spray as part of your equipment. It is, it is very, very useful and it's extremely effective. So exclusion, this is gonna be more for neighborhoods than for camping, but um, securing trash cans. This thing here is a trash caddy. Um, you can make them in all different kinds of styles. There are some that open on the top, there are some that open on the front so that you can just wheel bins in and out. Um, some neighborhoods have gotten together and actually made these so they hold like half a dozen cans at a time so that everybody has their trash kind of in one central area, but it's secure. Um, this is a good way to keep, keep wildlife out of them. Um, I've actually got instructions on how to take your trash can and put a mask kit on it to keep the lid shut so that if raccoons or bears or anything else knocks it over, they don't open. Um, if you, electric fencing again, really useful. If you have a garden plot, raccoons are getting into it, or if you have bees and bears are getting into them or anything else, Electric fencing is a really flexible way to keep wildlife out of things. Um, for things like backyard chickens, predator-proof enclosures. Um, it's a little bit hard to see in this picture, but there's a there's sturdy wire mesh. It's not just chicken wire here. Um, chicken wire is only good at keeping in chickens. Most wildlife can chew through chicken wire or scratch through it. It's not. It's only good at keeping birds in. It's not good at keeping predators out. So use quarter-inch hardware mesh or something tougher. Don't put perches right up against the fence. Raccoons are really famous for reaching up through the wire and yanking parts of animals out of the wire in order to chew on them. That's a terrible way to lose a bird. Uh, so use small mesh or don't put the perches right next to the edges of the, of the area. And digging aprons um, that go out, either down into the soil and out, or out at least 18 inches will stop the animals from digging into your food. Um, fencing. We do recommend, if you're trying to keep coyotes out, um, coyotes can jump a six-foot fence if they can get their feet over the top. So what you want to do is keep them from getting their feet over the top. You can use angled overhangs. Um, this thing right here is also getting a lot more popular. This is called a coyote roller. 
Um, those are three spinning metal tubes at the top of the fence. People are also actually using these. The companies that sell them are marketing them also to keep badly jumping dogs inside your yard. Um, basically, they jump up, they put their feet on it, it spins, and they fall back. So whether you're trying to keep things out or in, it seems to be very functional. Um, a lot of people are having good successes with these. And some large-scale agricultural operations are using them too, um, for things like orchards, which have high value crops. So enjoying parks safely. Since we are being hosted by Tim Kwan Parks, and you will see a lot of these wildlife animals out while you're hiking, or you may see evidence, tracks, or scat, or other, other evidence, um, again, never feed wildlife. The reason I harp on this is because it's successful. If you don't feed them, they don't get used to people, they maintain their wild nature. Make noise if you think wildlife is nearby. Avoidance is key because confrontation wastes calories. So if you just make some noise while you're walking, a regular conversational tone is enough to keep most wildlife alert enough to be able to move away from you. Watch wildlife from a safe distance. I just have to say this one. I know you guys are smart and you know better than to approach wildlife, but you know, there's always there's always that one guy, like the one that was caught on the, uh, the Alaska bear camera wading into the river to, to go take pictures of grizzly bears catching salmon, and he was caught on the live stream that's always out there that the National Park streams. Um, that guy was, was fine because, and he's super lucky that that's all that happened to him. Um, watch wildlife from a safe distance. Um, especially around the springtime, it's baby season. If you see an, a wildlife animal acting defensive, it may be trying to protect a den or a nest. Um, just like a bird will try to leave you away from a nest sometimes. You want to just keep a safe distance. Keep your pets on a six foot lead. Um, especially if you're hiking, a lot of the trails and things have rules about making sure that pets are on a leash. Um, but especially if your dog doesn't have a good come when you call, you're going to want to keep them on a lead. And practice clean camping practices. Um, things that are clean camping. Prevent odors. Um, if you're in a, now some of this stuff, you don't have to do all of this if you're not in a bare area, but this is sort of your maximum level of preparedness. Um, bag food, toothpaste, anything else scented, deodorant, sunscreen, um, hang it in a scent-proof bag 10 feet up and four feet away from the trunks of trees or other structures. That will keep bears out of it. Keep tents empty of anything scented. Um, I would say that if, when I camp, I keep scented things out of my tent, even though I'm not in a bear area most of the places I camp, um, because I also don't want raccoons in my tent. They're terribly destructive. Um, don't keep beef jerky in your tent overnight as a snack. <laughs> keep it in a separate spot. If you have coolers, either put marine locks on your coolers so they can't be opened or keep them in your car. Um, food preparation areas should be far away from your tent. And then don't leave pets outside overnight. If you're at a campsite, um, they could attract or fight with wildlife, and that's just no fun for anybody on a camping trip. So I've told you guys a bunch of do's and don'ts. Um, what can you do to help promote healthy native wild populations of animals? Um, secure attractants that you don't want to bring animals in. Um, planting native nectar bearing plants is great because that sort of builds your wildlife habitat from the ground up. It brings in your native pollinators, which in turn will bring your native birds to eat them. Um, it provides way stations. This Florida is a major stopping point on the migration trail for so many birds um, during the great, great migrations in the fall and spring. Maintain a natural landscape that promotes foraging and shelter for wildlife and also cuts down the amount of grass that you have to mow, cuts down on your water bill. Discourage repeat visits from unwelcome neighbors by implementing harassment techniques every time you see the animal. The two keys for hazing animals are consistency and persistence. Be consistent and persistent, and it won't be very long. The animal will say, this is not for me. I am going to go somewhere else. Um, if you want to do something to help conserve wildlife, you can always um, buy a conserve wildlife tag. This money goes directly to wildlife conservation here in Florida, and so it's a great way to help out um, by doing something automatic every year. You have to renew your tag every two years at least, so that's a good way to help. And if you have additional questions, contact your local wildlife assistance biologist, me, um, and I can help you with whatever kind of questions you have, because chances are, if I haven't heard it before, I can ask one of my coworkers who might have also heard it before. Um, we have a lot of really interesting questions all over the state. So finding help when you have questions. This is, of course, really important because you want to know, well, where do I call? So we have five <coughs> regional offices. Um, you are in the north central region. Our office for north central is Lake City. 
So the North Central um, office is right here. This is a good um, one that if you want to take a cell phone picture, this is a good one to take a picture of because it's all your numbers in one place. Um, if North, so the regional offices are open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, Eastern Time. If it's after business hours or on the weekends, if you have a wildlife problem or you think somebody's committing a wildlife violation, you can call the Wildlife Alert Hotline right here. That's staffed 24 hours a day. Officers can respond on an as available basis. They do have to triage the calls. If they're performing a boat rescue, they're not going to stop and be a snake for you, but they, they do um, always have somebody at that number. Statewide Nuisance Alligator Program is right here. Um, they're FWC Gator. And uh, they take all of the alligator calls statewide. You can also go online and ask questions through our Ask FWC system through myfwc.com. Um, that actually will go to uh, a person who assigns it based on the type of question that you have, and then you'll get sent to a subject matter expert. And then if you see non-natives, um, again, that doesn't happen as often here as some of the more southern regions, but um, if you do have non-native wildlife and you, or you think it might be, you can call our I've Got One hotline. Um, and they will help you either ID them or tell you what you can do um, with the site that you've had and answer questions about it for you. There's also an app for I've Got One. Yes, there is an I've Got One app as well. That's right. There's always an app for that. <laughs> so, any questions? How to differentiate the difference between a uh, black razor and an indigo? How do you tell a black racer from an indigo? That's a great question. The main thing is going to be size. A baby indigo snake, even a juvenile, is quite a bit sort of uh, thicker around than a black racer. Black racers tend to top out at right around two feet and about as thick as my thumb. Um, they have a plain white stomach and a white chin. Um, most, indi uh, most of the indigos are going to have a red chin. You say black racers only get two feet long? Yeah, they're not, they're not really big. I mean, two, three feet long is about the max you're gonna see. They're, they're very skinny. They're like thumb, thumb size. So if I see something four feet, it's an indigo. Could be. I mean, you can always send it into us. The, the indigos do have the red, dark chin with the vertical chin stripes. Um, sometimes they have like a cream colored chin, but racers also have, um, have like great big round eyes. And the indigo snakes, their scales kind of, um, protect the eyes a little bit more because they spend more time in burrows and things, so they kind of look like they're frowning a little bit compared to a black racer, which always looks surprised. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, are you seeing any foxes? Um, we do see foxes. I actually see foxes in my neighborhood. Um, I live in Jacksonville, so we do have both red and gray foxes here in Florida. The gray would be our native North American one, and the red fox is considered naturalized now. Will a coyote attack them? Um, if a coyote got a chance, it would probably try to eat a fox, but only if probably a sick or an old fox would be likely prey because foxes are pretty fast. Um, you know, they will eat stuff that's smaller than them, but foxes foxes can also be an issue for small pets. Um, again, even though you know a cat, you know cats can be anywhere from six to twenty pounds, um, a twenty pound fox might not bother a twenty pound cat, but still, some of the, for small pets, some of the wildlife is still big enough to injure them, so we don't want them to get bites. Who's going to eat the squirrels? Um, well, coyotes, coyotes will actually eat squirrels. And I'm actually going to pop up. I have this, which is the duplicate of the banner that's out there. So you guys can take a look at that while I talk. But, um, hope, you know, hopefully bobcats will eat a squirrel. Um, coyotes will eat squirrels. Foxes will take them if they catch them on the ground. How can we get rid of them? <laughs> If you have if you have specific things that you're trying to keep them out of, um, you can. Well, for for that, you've got to build a better bird feeder, mostly. Um, it's it's tough to keep squirrels out of feeders because squirrels will often get better at it. Okay, the feral cat is the food source. Is a feral cat a wild animal? A feral cat and is a, is a domestic feral. Um, they're not considered wildlife because they are <coughs> they are an animal that. Uh, you know, even, even if you were to bring wildlife species in and keep it in captivity for generations, um, it would still be wild. It would not be a domestic animal the way that if you bring a, you know, if you bring a two-day-old feral cat in, it will be raised a domestic cat. Those are, those are considered escape domestics or outdoor domestics. Um, feral cats, uh, like I said, you know, FWC's official position is the cats belong in horse. Clearly, very feral cats cannot be kept inside. Um, so I know that Jacksonville has a strong trap-neuter-return program. Um, the point of trap-neuter-return 
is to reduce fighting, reduce reproduction, get a vaccinated reservoir of animals because they are also being vaccinated while they're, while they're getting sterilized. That reduces the amount of disease transmission that can happen, but feral cats, as far as the track neuter return program goes, they're not meant to, they're meant to be um, taken by necroposis. Necroposis sometimes include old age, sometimes it includes predation if they're outdoors. I mean, this is, they are outdoor cats. They do have a better life because they're vaccinated. They're not dying from communicable diseases, but feral cats are considered a domestic species that people are choosing to manage outside. Um, they're not expected to live as long as an indoor house cat. So if the coyotes are not considered natural, uh, are they protected by the Well, they kill them anytime. Yeah, coyotes have an open, so coyotes are one of the species here in Florida, um, bat and wild pigs, feral hogs, um, that have an open year-round hunting season. There's no tape limit on size, age, gender, uh, or number. There's no, there's no number limits either. So in theory, you can kill as many coyotes as you want, whenever you want, on your own private land, or on other lands um, if you've got a license for it. However, that said, weapons discharge laws do still need to be followed. So there is such a thing as reckless discharge. That would be something that you would want to talk to your local law enforcement about. Well, so. Going back to the feral cats, if you can yes, kill sir. a coyote, why can't you kill a feral cat? <laughs> that, that's not, they're not wildlife animals. Sir, I can't answer that question. Yes, sir. Do you know how many coyotes are in Jacksonville? Do you have an estimate? That's, that's a good question. We would love to do more um, population studies. It's actually something we're looking at trying to get funding for to do some urban coyote studies, like uh, maybe not as complex as Chicago has done. Um, I think Chicago has gotten some really good preliminary results and they may have a population estimate for them, but we don't currently have an estimate. We do know that they can only get so dense, like they can only have one family per three square miles maximum. Um, it seems to be the smallest space that they can use. So if you go by the square mileage, you can you can theoretically get a maximum number, but we don't we don't have good population estimates. But what about right anecdotal calls that people get in? I can tell you, I can tell you that I know that I've had reports from lots of different neighborhoods in Jacksonville, so they are clearly utilizing the urban space, but I mean, if, if I do get a report of a coyote in one area, then I know that there's probably a coyote family living there. Um, it doesn't tell me, you know, how close the next family is over to it, but we, you know, I do get calls from lots of different neighborhoods. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's a good question. How old do coyotes get? Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Kat, but I think they found in the wild that coyotes are only living between five and 10, five and 10 years, and 10 when you're really old for a wild coyote. Um, in zoos that have coyotes, they live about the same age as a domestic dog that same size. So they would live a little longer, like 10, 10 to 12 in captivity, but they're usually living to be about five in the wild. Is it unusual to see a raccoon out during the daytime? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of our wildlife animals, people think they're fully nocturnal and they get really they get really concerned when they see them in the daytime. Um, a lot of our wildlife animals are what we would more consider dawn and dusk animals. Um, so it's not unusual to see them out when it's daytime, um, especially as we move into spring and everybody's reproducing and they have young ones to take care of. Um, just like anybody that's a new parent, they're keeping really weird hours. <laughs> so if you see it acting unusual, that, that may be something else. Um, we do occasionally get calls, um, for instance, with animals that have symptoms that are pretty consistent with distemper. Um, without testing, the actual animal itself, we can't say yes, that's definitely a distemper because you have to do a physical test to be sure, but the symptoms are consistent and those animals will often be out during the day, but healthy animals are out during the day too. Thank you. Yes, sir. Did you say that coyotes uh, hunt raccoons? Coyotes will eat raccoons, yes, sir. And it, when you try, if the raccoon has rabies, would that then be transmitted? Um, I mean, if usually rabies can be transmitted through blood, saliva, and brain material. Um, 
the, the benefit to having coyotes eat raccoons is that they're reducing the population, so there's not as much crossover. They're not able to transmit it to each other as often. Um, as we've seen, you know, we have had coyotes here for the last 20 years, and even so, we didn't see, you know, we've only had the one coyote up until just recently that, that tested positive. So even though they've been steadily eating raccoons since they got here, they don't seem to be getting a lot of a lot of rabies from them. Yes, sir. You talked about the crossbreeding. I, I killed a coyote in Lamb Beach. Coyotes and dogs breed at different times of the year, um, and coyotes generally either see dogs as competition or food. They don't they don't breed with them preferentially if they have other coyotes. And as we've seen, there's no shortage of coyotes in Florida. Um, we we don't see that. It is possible people have put them together in captivity, and it's happened. Um, but so far, from that diet study that I showed you, where we, we collected 150 carcasses, um, the preliminary results for that haven't had any canine DNA in them. Um, you know, dogs tend to be eating heat in the spring and in the fall, and coyotes go into heat in the winter, so their breeding periods don't overlap. Um, as far as the carcass goes, you know, we're always we're always interested in seeing more data. We would love to have gotten a hold of the carcass to, to weigh in and test it. Um, that's Oh, yes, sir. Did they tell you that they just wanted to do that? Oh, if you found, what did you find? Coyotes. You found dead coyotes? And I, I don't know. If you call the police on emergency lines, sometimes they will notify FWC if it's a wildlife issue. Um, we don't currently have a program to pick up carcasses like in general. Uh -huh. uh, so if, if they, but if there I are some instances. Call that number, that number, that number, that um, you can call and it would be on a case by case basis. I mean, like I said, if you think you've got one that's, that's record breaking or something like that, then we could certainly pick it up. But as far as just a wildlife animal being dead, um, you know, that, that does happen naturally. So we don't, we don't yeah, need to have road, pick them up. Oh, okay. Sure. That said, um, if y'all, one number I didn't put on here, um, the FWC is making a really big push to collect uh, samples from deer over the next two years um, because we have an illness called chronic wasting disease. So if you do see roadkill deer, feel free to call Wildlife Alert Hotline. Um, let us know where it is. If we have a biologist available, we'll send them out to get a sample because we're making a huge push across our northern counties to collect samples. We don't have it here in Florida yet, but it's a huge problem across the U.S., so we're, we're doing a lot of monitoring. Speaking of roadkill, sorry, you reminded me. Have you run into any coyotes hunting in packs? They do hunt in families. So the alpha pair, the, the mated pair, um, they will sometimes hunt together. And then when the pups are older, in the late summer and early fall, they will teach them how to hunt. So you will see them together. Um, but as far as what, what a lot of times when people call me and ask me about packs, what they're considering a pack is kind of the way they think of the dog pack, which is a whole bunch of unrelated animals that get together and they get like that pack mentality and they just rip stuff up for no reason. That's something really common with domestic dogs, um, that they just kill stuff because it's moving. Um, that pack mentality is what a lot of people think of and they get really concerned. Wildlife animals are killing for food. They're killing because they're hungry, they want to eat. So if they are hunting together, they will hunt together for food. Um, but they're not, they're not like a group of domestic dogs where they're just going to get together and, and terrorize stuff. You know, that's, that's not what wildlife is about. They're about surviving. So they're, they're doing it to eat, not, not just to rip stuff up. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Tell, tell us how you use the bear spray. Oh, that's a great question. And actually, we do have a video on our website. If you go to the bear page on myfwc.com, um, we actually have a link that takes you to a YouTube video so you can watch it at home. So bear spray, um, you want to make sure that you're getting one that's actual bear spray. It should be at least seven and a half ounces. It'll be labeled for bears. Um, you don't want to use personal protection spray. It's used up close because you, you know, if you're using it for personal protection, it's, it's the person who's going to be close to you. Bear spray is designed to be used at a distance. You want to hold it out in front of you. They sell, okay, so this is really important. This is going to sound dumb. 
but they sell training canisters with just colored water in them. Buy yourself a training canister, especially if you're gonna go camping somewhere and use it. It sounds silly, but I've been through a lot of different kinds of training for emergency things, and uh, the last time I did fire extinguisher training, they told me they couldn't tell you the number of people who have tried to use a fire extinguisher and have mangled the handle until they couldn't use it anymore because they failed to pull the pin. So it sounds stupid, but there's a safety that you have to slot off the bear spray before you use it. So get the practice canister and use it before you go camping. Um, it will save you a lot of grief. So basically what you want to do is you take your can of bear spray. You, usually they have, um, you can pull the clip by, or the pin by thumbing it off, depending on the brand, or they have a ring that you yank. So you, that's how you arm it, you take off the safety, and you want to point it for the animal. You do need to be aware of the wind. If it goes back at you, you will be functional, but you will have a bad day. Be aware of the wind, you want to point it toward and slightly down, and spray in a one second burst. What that does, a lot of times, especially if the wind is with you, is it'll actually put a wall of spray up between you and the animal, and the second they run into that, they stop thinking about you at all. There's, um, when you go to look on our, on our website, um, go to that video, um, it'll take you to YouTube, it'll, and it's a guy who's a backcountry guide, and he shows how to use bear spray. One of the videos that's down on the side where YouTube says you may also like is one of a guy using bear spray on a polar bear up in the Arctic, and it is amazing how little of it it takes to get that polar bear to just the other way. Does it just more more? Yeah. All right, I think man, some. I just wanted to ask it on this gator number that you have. Mm -hmm. um, if you have gator in the lake and, and you call this number, what happens to the gator? Do you kind of get it or what? So alligators under four <laughs> feet are not really considered too much of a hazard. Um, they will only call for they will only send somebody out for gators over four feet. Um, alligators are considered a recovered species with a managed hunting season here in Florida. The population is doing really well. What they do is they send a contractor out who will um, come and catch and kill the alligator. If it's in a place where you're considering it to be a public safety issue, then they, they can't catch and re-release them. Um, just to let you folks know, although re-release or relocation seems like a much kinder alternative, it's usually very cruel. Um, it is not the nice thing that everybody thinks it is. Um, we have so many healthy alligators in the state that relocating an alligator generally ends up upsetting the balance of alligators that are already living somewhere. They get in a lot of fights and the newcomer or the resident ones are often killed. So the contractors, um, part of their pay is to, is to take the alligator and sell the meat and hide. So they'll, they'll come to collect it, but alligators that are, that are collected through SNAP will be killed. And generally it's not just because there's an alligator there. Right. It needs to be a nuisance or, you know, public safety, so mm -hmm. they'll please some sure. talk about that because there's alligators everywhere. We obviously can't catch every alligator in every pond. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate you.